everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, this is Martin Kikta uh, of the uh, LA SID chapter. Uh, and today we have a guest speaker, Chris Chinook. Uh, he's uh, spoken in the past for us. What a, he's, what a great guy, I gotta, I gotta say that first. He is an industry consultant and writer serving clients in emerging uh, display ecosystems, uh, such as mini, micro, LED, 8K, light field displays, holographic, AR, VR, MR, and content production. Chris will be reporting on some of the highlights of this past SID Display Week in that occurred in 2023. I think that was two months ago. Um, and we will be taking questions, Chris will be taking questions only in chat, uh, in the, through the chat line. Uh, and after every section uh, he reports on. Chris, take it away. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, now the title of this talk is Selected Highlights from Display Week. Uh, in reality, it's mostly about uh, micro LED uh, highlights. Uh, there's a couple other things I threw in, there, but it's uh, generally based on uh, most of the video uh, recordings that I did at Display Week, and you can see at the bottom of this slide, there's a, uh, a link to the playlist there. I think there's, I don't know, 20 or 25 uh, little videos. Uh, but th these are just me basically summarizing what I just learned uh, from the folks talking uh, in the booth. Uh, it's almost, it's all, I guess it is all exhibitor um, videos at this point. Uh, so it's just me rambling on about what I learned. And so this slide deck that I'm talking to you uh, tonight about um, is summarizes some of those videos, um, uh, and I added in some additional information from some of the symposium uh, sessions uh, uh, I also uh, attended. So with that background, let me kind of uh, jump in. So we'll start with a little bit of an overview. Um, this is the outline here. Uh, we want to talk about full color single pixels or kind of stacked uh, micro LEDs. Uh, talk a little bit about AR and VR and then direct view micro LED devices, some materials manufacturing, and then I'll get into some of the, the non micro LED stuff with uh, a couple of things, a couple of slides on 3D and some other cool stuff I saw there. So, Let's uh, level set here on, on LEDs and terminology here. Um, uh, we talk about micro LEDs and mini LEDs and traditional LEDs. So this is a nice chart I thought that kind of summarizes uh, the scale here. Um, we've got these three categories and you know there is some disagreement exactly where these boundaries are between traditional and mini and mini and micro. So you know, this, this is close enough for, for these purposes, I think, here. Um, but the point is, um, you know, micro LEDs is the hot topic in the display industry right now. Mini LEDs, of course, are important as well. Um, but there's a ton of activity going on in, in micro LEDs. And generally, these are less than 30 microns or so long. And again, it depends how you measure it, but it's, uh, it's one side or another. It's generally less than 30 microns or 50 microns, depending where you draw the line. Uh, so there's two basic categories for micro LEDs, uh, and I've kind of divided them into this monolithic category and the direct view category. So the monolithic category um, are fully integrated devices. Um, so that means uh, these are targeted for the, the AR, VR, uh, applications for HUD applications or projection applications where magnification is required. These are micro displays in the traditional sense that they're you know, the very small devices, typically less than an inch, inch and a half. Uh, they have very tiny uh, emitters, typically less than 10 microns. Uh, they're directly integrated onto a CMOS driving back plane. Uh, and they maintain that the basically the, the wafer level pixel pitch um, that you get um, as a final display solution. Uh, it's a micro display. Um, and then the other ones are, uh, are direct view. So the, the micro LEDs are typically fabricated in the same way, but the emitters uh, are going to be bigger at this point. Typically, again, now up, you know, less than 50 microns, but bigger than, than 10 microns. 
but now they're going to go on to into a display application where the pixel pitch changes from the uh, the as fabricated on on the wafer. So now we're talking about digital signage. You're talking about small wearables like watches uh, and TVs and, and automotive. Uh, and now you've got a whole bunch of different choices that you can start to um, make in terms of, of how you design and develop these um, in terms of the backplane technology could be glass, uh, printed circuit board, poly image. Um, these can be, there's the different drivers that can be associated with each of those just, uh, backplane uh, choices. You've got various pixel pitches, various uh, uh, sizes of displays and modules. Uh, so typically now you're going to make a, a display solution, a monitor, a TV from a series of modules. And those modules, um, again, can vary by size. They can be transparent, they can be opaque, so lots of stuff that we'll get into. So let's start with some of the challenges. Um, so I, I went through some of the presentations. Uh, this, this, this quote came out from, uh, from Epistar in one, in one of the presentations from the business section uh, at, at Display Week. And you know, Art sees these, uh, they're a, Epistar is a, a, a device manufacturer. So they want to make, they're making the wafers like this. This is a, a semiconductor wafer, a uh, gallium nitride wafer with a whole bunch of devices. Uh, fabricated on it. I don't know, Bill it says it's a six inch. So it's COW's chip on wafer. That's their designation there. So what are the big problems? Well, wafer uniformity, and this is a map. I don't know if this is luminance or it's probably luminance that they're mapping here. Um, so you see there's a difference in color, there's a difference in brightness, and all those things will be uh, clearly measurable by metrology instrumentation, but they're also visible uh, to the human eye, um, and that's the just noticeable difference that you have to, uh, the criteria that you have to pass. Yield, uh, there are so many steps in this process, and the, <laughs> he's talked about uh, basically two nines, two and a half nines here for the first yield pass of mounting devices on the final display backplane, whatever that may be, but there are multiple other yields in this process. And as we're going to see, you're going to have to have um, a total process yield that's probably closer to five or six nines to become a mass producible uh, process at this point, which is very challenging. And of course, uh, cost. So um, the the he mentions OLED's display as kind of the, the benchmark to to measure cost against, but of course, uh, LCD displays are going to contribute. Uh, compete in many of these applications uh, as well. Some other quotes I pulled out of presentations, one from Torre, uh, speaking of challenges, handling these smaller micro uh, LED chips. You know, when you get down to single micron uh, uh, emitters, how do you move and move those around and transfer them? And how do you do that in a stable process? Um, that's not easy. Um, you're going to have to have a, a, a repair process that needs to be efficient. And then uh, minimizing this image discoloration, which is basically what uh, the Epistar uh, was talking about. Uh, so Ron Merton, Mertens uh, it runs this Micro LED Association, a new association that's been formed in the last year or so to try and um, de uh, develop this process. Uh, epi, -whale, epi wafer level deposition and chip processing yield and stability quality control, and the transfer process quality and efficiency. So you can see a, a, a theme here. Um, basically, the process is immature at this point. Other challenges, uh, repair or redundancy. Uh, so here's, here's where you see all these yields coming in here. Uh, for a, a, a 4K display that's 24 million emitters, uh, if you have two defective pixels, that's five nines of yield. That's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of quality control. So you're going to have to have a repair uh, process or a redundancy uh, 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 solution here. And some people are actually talking about putting multiple LEDs, uh, having a redundant LED in almost every uh, pixel position, which is kind of crazy. 
but unless you have a good uh, repair process, uh, some people are moving in that direction. Uh, so since all these processes are still in development and ongoing, there is no standard uh, workflow, basically, at this point. And without standards, it's hard for people to get behind certain processes and to get that that uh, that scale and to get the invest the investment behind uh, a certain process to to bring down the volumes and the, to increase the volumes and bring down the cost. Full color, um, we certainly can do red, green, and blue LEDs, but doing them together uh, on a, a display um, it becomes uh, well, there's many options to do that, and we'll talk about that. So a lot of choices there. And then cost. Um, obviously, the cost of micro LEDs at this point uh, is is prohibitive for many of the applications that they're being targeted for. Uh, my uh, my belief is that the only way we're going to get there is to move to more uh, semicon uh, silicon semiconductor-like processing, and that's going to mean uh, fabricating these devices. The, the the micro LED devices um, on eight and or 12 inch uh, semiconductor like fabs. And there are many folks working in that direction, but we're not there yet. So if we talk about um, some of the mic uh, monolithic micro LED development issues, uh, backplane integration. So remember when you're doing monolithic, you're mating uh, a, a a semiconductor CMOS backplane driver circuit to uh, a gallium nitride uh, LED, and you've got to bond those two together. And doing that with uh, yield and again solving the planarity problems and the Boeing problems uh, has been challenging. And we've received some reports recently that Meta uh, uh, has, which has been using Plessy semiconductors uh, wafer to wafer bonding solution, is having some problems. Uh, and kind of not surprisingly, these are these are big challenges. Uh, we talked about full color creation, so we can do it uh, with color conversion with quantum dots, inkjet or photolithography, stacked or color changing pixels. Uh, there are three channel solutions out there, so lots of lots of variations on a theme here that that various companies are exploring and sometimes exploring in multiple multiple solutions to try and find the, the best one. Uh, to move forward with. Uh, as with uh, the direct view, um, uh, micro LED devices, costs and yields and lack of production standards is also a problem here with the monolithic side. Um, so on the direct view micro LED side, the market outlook here, um, the market is tiny today. And here's a couple of forecasts, one looking at the uh, the chip market value and the other as, as uh, more applications oriented um, from uh, display supply chain consultants. Um, but both of these forecasts are pretty optimistic, but you know, nothing really important, <laughs> pretty important happens until 25, maybe 26. So we're still early in the game here, realistically, to start to make a dent in, in terms of, of volume production. Uh, but wearables, TVs uh, seem to be the most um, well, what companies seem to be most focused on in the near term. Um, but automotive is also quite attractive, and we saw quite a bit uh, of automotive display applications at, at Display Week uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so, again, kind of two forecasts here just to see kind of where we're at here. But there are some very good uh, positive trends that we're starting to see. Um, for example, <laughs> We're, I mean, we're literally talking billions of dollars that's being poured into micro LED development um, over the last number of years here. So according to, to Yo, uh, a market research firm, um, they ca they've calculated about $8 billion has been spent by the end of 22, and they're projecting it's that another $7.3 billion will be spent uh, through the, in the next couple of years to 25 on infrastructure development and manufacturing. Um, now, that seems like a lot of money, but it's also kind of um, just opening sticks compared to the money being spent on OLED, less so in LCD now because that's more mature, but certainly an investment in, in, in OLED is, is an order of magnitude more than that right now. 
uh, but costs are declining uh, quite rapidly. Um, you can see in this, uh, this chart up here in the upper right uh, from Play Nitride, uh, they're seeing those chip prices coming down nicely. Uh, we're seeing lots and lots of innovation in, in this space as well. New processes and configurations, things like uh, micro LEDs in packages. So putting um, uh, RGB or multiple RGB sets in standard uh, chip packages, which makes them much more easier, make it easier to integrate into existing workflows to create uh, modules, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, we're seeing micro LEDs uh, on micro IC devices, kind of a different way of putting it together instead of putting it on a traditional backplane. Nano wire emitters are a kind of an emerging in, and very interesting area as well. We've seen some stretchable displays. There was actually stretchable micro LEDs uh, at uh, Display Week this year. And I put down electrohydrodynamic inkjet printing, which is kind of a variation on inkjet printing um, that's allowing the de deposition of quantum dots down to a single micron level. So I thought that was a pretty important innovation that uh, I became aware of anyway at, uh, at Display Week. Uh, efficiency losses for tiny micro LEDs is a big problem because they become less efficient. Uh, down maybe around 10 microns or so, they re really start to fall off. Uh, so we're seeing good, good progress in that area. Uh, we're seeing process yields, transfer speeds, and chip efficiency uh, all uh, improving. We have multiple papers talking about that at Display Week. And we're seeing, um, uh, well, kind of an interesting, I, this, this wasn't really highlighted at, uh, at Display Week, but because micro LEDs uh, leverage uh, semiconductor processing, they leverage uh, some of the existing uh, display infrastructure um, and, and LED infrastructure, the CapEx to become a micro LED developer is nowhere near what's needed to be an OLED or an LCD manufacturer. Uh, that means that creates opportunity actually for developers in the US or in, uh, or in Europe uh, to actually start to create domestic display production capabilities. There's some little stuff happening right now in that area, um, but you know, there's a lot of uh, trade issues in the world right now. So um, that could be an interesting trend uh, to keep an eye on in the future. And, and you can see in this other chart here uh, from Yol, uh, the, here's, there's, this is their roadmap for bringing down the cost of, of dye for 4K and, and 8K TV. So, um, you know, we start to get to very attractive prices, but there's still, you know, a number of years out here. So let me stop there if there are any questions on that kind of introductory stuff and, and market overview. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat window yet, uh, Chris. Okay, well, let's move on then. So Actually, this, I, I put a, a question up. Sure. Uh, Chris, what are the EQEs of the uh, blue, green, and red uh, micro LED? It totally depends on the manufacturer, and it depends very much on the on the um, the emitter size uh, um, and the drive current. <laughs> um, so I do have some numbers for for Poratech that they shared with me on some of their devices. Uh, so that's a little bit further in the slide deck. So if you just be patient. Thank you. Yep. Um, so. Actually, the rest of the this deck is really going to be more of a review of of uh, company by company uh, that I saw at, at Display Week. Um, so uh, let me just uh, dive into that with uh, with Sun Diode. They won an award uh, in the I Zone for their monolithic stacked RGB. And this this section I'm calling full color single pixels. Um, so this is not your traditional uh, red, green, and blue. Um, uh, devices or color converter. These are single pixels uh, that uh, are that can create red, green, and blue or the full uh, color palette with a single device. Uh, and this is a very hot and a very important topic area here. Um, so Sundial was one of the companies that's showing this uh, single pixel 
solution uh, and it's it's stacked um, RGB. So the idea here is you basically take three uh, epi layers, um, red, green, and blue, blue epi layers, and you find a way to, to mount them uh, literally on top of each other uh, and they emit from, they emit through each other or through windows uh, in that structure. Uh, so they have done this, um, they've done actually a very impressive device. It's a, it's a four contact device. So you've got a contact for red, green, and blue, and then a common, uh, common anode, I guess it is, uh, to, for all of them. Uh, so that's, that's a very interesting architecture that, and they just had their first prototype at, uh, uh, at Display Week with, with 100 micron pixels, and they're in development now of, of a four micron pixel device. Um, so they claim low light losses, they, and, and the demo was impressive, but they don't have a lot of data at this point. Uh, Seoul Semiconductor has also been doing this. Um, they have uh, also a stacked uh, kind of solution here, uh, and they showed um, their first devices are 200 by 200 um, micron emitters, so that's really in the mini LED camp here. Uh, they're moving to 100 by 100, still in the mini LED camp. Maybe it's uh, the border of micro LED, um, but they're really more focused on the on the digital signage market um, and going to smaller emitters, smaller and smaller emitters makes a lot of sense in digital signage. Digital signage LEDs are expensive and the biggest cost is, is the emitters themselves. Um, they're big and they're expensive. So if you can go to a single device as opposed to three devices and you can make that device small, you're saving a ton of money. Uh, and they kind of highlighted the, the money uh, uh, that you save here from manufacturing, the transfer costs, but you get uh, lots of other uh, capabilities here in terms of color and being able to reduce the, uh, or increase the black area, which increases contrast, or you can increase the, de the density. Um, so it gives you lots of, of design freedom, uh, which is, again, one of the, one of the benefits of, of not only smaller devices, but in single pixel devices as well. Uh, so like I said, they're targeting this 108 inch 4K display. And what they showed was something that's based on a, a, a 0.625 millimeter pitch, uh, which is basically a fine, a fine pitch digital signage kind of product. <coughs> All on PCB too, by the way. So typical digital signage stuff. Chris. Uh, uh, we got a question. Yeah. Uh, or, or we got a question from Bob Gold. He's asking, "What are the benefits to the industry for the sun diode architecture?" Well, it's yeah, it's it, it's multiple um, because you don't have three, and, and it's it's actually described pretty well here in this slide by Sol Semiconductor. Instead of having three uh, three wafers that you um, have to create three dif discrete devices on, you know, you now have one wafer albeit it's, it's, it's stacked with three epi layers, but it's, it's one transfer process instead of three transfer processes. Uh, it's, one, it's one device instead of three devices. It's put, potentially a, lower, uh, a more simplified driver circuit you could do with this. Uh, it gives you more space around the device to do other things like more black or higher density. So there's lots of, lots of benefits for doing this. Um, but like I said, the benefit of a single emitter is similar to the benefit of just going to smaller discrete emitters. And cost, obviously. Okay, so uh, uh, let's talk about Porotech. Uh, Porotech has developed uh, what they call this dynamic um, uh, pixel technology, the dynamic pixel tuning, DPT. Uh, and this is um, enabled, it's, it's a single pixel structure, but they don't stack it. Uh, what they do is they can, um, using a special drive uh, circuit, uh, they're able to basically address the pixel and move the indium doping around, uh, I believe, such that it can emit red, green, or blue, or even white. Um, so they've actually demonstrated this um, 
in a in an active matrix device uh, at display week uh, in both 0.26 and 0.39 inch uh, full color devices. Uh, obviously, this is focused more on the, the AR VR space, uh, but they can do this. They can create the the three colors using a field sequential color addressing technique. So a very interesting opportunity here and not using stacked epi layers. Okay, um, any other questions on the, the, the single pixel kind of solution before I move on? I don't see any other questions on the list here. Okay. So now let's talk about some of the devices that were actually shown. So Play Night tried, and again, we're kind of in this AR VR space here right now. Uh, 0.49 inch micro LED display, uh, full HD resolution, 4,500 PPI, clearly um, a micro display here. Now they did show this uh, last year at, at SID. Uh, so this year they added a color filter uh, to get a little bit better contrast, uh, a little bit better color, color purity, wider color gamut. Uh, it does use a quantum dot conversion and we'll come back to some of that in a little bit more. Uh, and they showed it with a couple of different uh, waveguide uh, demonstrators as well. Uh, Jadebird Display is actually one of the companies um, that can legitimately claim to be in mass production of micro LED displays. Um, they make these 0.13 VGA resolution um, in monochrome, red, green, or blue. Uh, and if you want to use this for uh, an uh, of an AR or a VR application, um, you can put it together in this little tiny projector, and, and you can see at the scale of this little tiny projector here, it's it's three little tiny panels and a cube combiner. It's a typical little projector with a little projection lens here, uh, which can feed that that image right into uh, into a waveguide. Uh, and so they have a number of customers they're working uh, to develop this kind of solution. This is a full color solution. It doesn't have to be a full color solution. You can use a single a monochrome panel for solutions uh, as well. Uh, and they're working on a 2K by 2K device. So big jump up from VGA, obviously. Uh, Poratech, uh, again, now coming back to some of their, um, their discrete devices here, they showed this 0.12 inch in red, green, and blue micro LEDs. Um, these are uh, and here's here, here, Martin, are your EQEs for these three micron pixels, a uh, red 10%, green 40%, blue 55%. So those are that's those are actually pretty good EQE uh, numbers. Uh, and then below, uh, since there's a lot of a lot of devices that were shown, and uh, in, in a lot of these companies, I kind of just summarized what they showed in this little table down below. Um, I think the the maybe important thing to look at here is, is kind of this other category, um, but you can see some of these are dynamic pixel tuning uh, devices as well, which we talked about in, the, in a slide or two back. And what's important about Poratech is they've got this, this kind of interface layer that they call this Poro GAN, uh, which is, it, it goes between um, the silicon uh, the substrate and the uh, gallium nitride epi layer, uh, and it, it helps to manage that lattice mismatch and, and potentially any, any uh, dislocations that come as a result of fabrication process, and it allows them to do this dynamic pixel tuning technology as well. Uh, moving on to Sitan technology, um, they're a, a new company. I think they were, I'd never heard of them before, but they have full color micro LED devices using color, uh, color conversion with quantum dots. Um, and they're using this modified inkjet printer. Uh, and this is this electrohydrodynamic uh, technology that I talked about earlier um, that allows you to get printing um, quantum dots down to two to three microns. That's pretty incredible. Um, so they've showed this, um, and again, there's a bunch of uh, uh, demos that they've shown up here, which you can take a look at. Um, but they're also developing an interesting um, uh, alternative. Um, so gallium nitride 
uh, epi layers are typically grown on sapphire and, uh, and more uh, more recently on on silicon um, so both substrates they think it's maybe it makes more sense to do to grow gallium nitride epi on a gallium nitride uh, bulk crystal uh, and so they have developed some technology to do that and the material system to do that it's very early stages in that but they claim and it's expensive obviously and there's no commercial uh, source for that right now but they claim uh, higher efficiency and fewer dislocations so that's that's an interesting development Uh, Paul's point. Got another question come in, uh, Chris. Yeah. Uh, then what is the size of the projected image from the micro projector? Uh, well, that depends. If he's talking about the um, uh, Jaybird, um, yeah, that depends on the waveguide that it goes into. Um, so it, it depends on the very much on the waveguide design, right? It, it depends on uh, well, that's not true. There is a limitation, um, but it's v it's VGA, so you don't want to make it too big. It's going to look, you know, pixelated. Um, I believe most of the waveguides that's using that VGA device is is smaller, like 25 or 30 degrees field of view, as I recall. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Okay, let's move to uh, the direct view devices. Um, so now a lot of these devices were now focused on the auto automotive market. Uh, Tiyama in particular was almost all focused on automotive. Um, so uh, if you look in the uh, in the matrix down below here, um, they have their, they make their devices uh, using a LTPS uh, backplane on glass. Obviously, they have pretty small emitters, 30 by 15. Um, and they made them, uh, they're using, um, these are transparent displays. So one of these, one of these devices uh, has greater than 70% trans, uh, transmissivity or transparency. Another had uh, more than 65% and the other was variable. Uh, and they got the variable um, basically by putting, and it's actually a 3D display, by putting a second LCD panel in, in back of it, which provides kind of a second image or can be, um, I guess, kind of a, a um, yeah, I guess it's a second image. So it looks like a 3D display, a, a two, a two plane 3D display, quasi 3D display. Um, but they're using discrete RGBs. These are not color converted. So, you know, here's, here's kind of one, one version of how you make choices in, uh, in all these design parameters. In PPI and in module display size and resolution and active matrix versus passive matrix on are you doing LTPS versus oxide size of your emitter the transparency the color technology so lots of different choices here plain nitride makes different choices um, so they they showed um, this kind of waterfall display which is more of a a passive matrix PCB kind of solution, which is more uh, a traditional um, digital signage, digital signage, signage kind of solution. Um, so this water, this one is like 2,000 nits. So that's you know that can move into production. I think they're actually taking orders for that now. Um, but they're also looking at the consumer uh, market, in particular the wearables. So they had a wall up here which had a bunch of, um, of watch displays with various types of, uh, of technology. They were, all this, they were all the same size. They're all the same resolution. They're all passive matrix uh, uh, on a glass uh, back plan, which is interesting. Uh, they're all full color, but they now they use different color te uh, uh, technologies. Some use discrete micro LEDs, so red, green, and blue from separate wafers. One used cadmium-based quantum dots for color version, conversion, and the other was cadmium-free quantum dots for color conversion. Um, and I believe that a year before they had a demo like this where they had 
uh, a similar display that had um, was comparing photolithography-based quantum dot deposition versus inkjet printing. Um, so you can see these companies are experimenting with all these different uh, variations on a theme um, to show their customers and to see which one might make more sense from a manufacturing uh, perspective. Inolux uh, again heavily focused on the on the gla on the uh, automotive space here. Um, so they're um, they're uh, again using Active Matrix uh, uh, LTPS on glass, small pretty small micron size for the emitters. Um, but now here's your color tech now discrete micro LEDs discrete and then inkjet printed quantum dot color conversion. Uh, so. One was this 1.1-inch uh, uh, kind of, uh, I guess you call it a dashboard display or indicator. Um, they had this 9.6-inch, which could be uh, used in a dashboard. I think these, that's what they're showing up here in this dashboard demo, and a 12.3-inch, which could also be in a dashboard, but could maybe be uh, a monitor because they showed um, a 2 by 2 by 6 or 2 by 3 configuration of that in, as a 20.6-inch. 26 inch uh, monitor. Uh, AUO, uh, their choices are all active, ma active matrix uh, LTPS on glass, small micron under 30 or under 40. Uh, they have a range of, of uh, opaque and transparent displays here. Uh, some are color converted, some are, I think, discrete RGB. Uh, but you'll see, look at the luminance. Some of these are actually quite bright uh, in terms of luminance. Um, but these are also bigger displays here as well, 13.5 uh, inch uh, to 17.3. They do have this one one inch one here uh, that had an integrated fingerprint sensor. And so, the, so let's, let me make that point about the fingerprint sensor. Um, because if you make the micro LEDs small, and depending on what the pixel pitch is, the PPI, at 200 PPI, you may also now have room to put in additional devices in the space between the micro LEDs. That could be uh, sensing elements, uh, it could be communication elements, it could be perhaps touch elements. Um, but you have the ability now to have to create a, let's call it a hybrid display. It's more than display, uh, which is which is something that you typically don't see in, in so much in OLED or, or LCD, but is very much being thought about uh, for micro LED. Um, so AUO is also one of the more aggressive uh, uh, developers here, and they're probably they've already announced that they're going to try to be going into mass production in, uh, with micro LEDs in 25, I, as I recall. Uh, so some of the other stuff that we saw here, uh, BOE has this uh, showed 165 inch 4K signage demo, 75 by 150 micron uh, micro LEDs on a glass backplane. Um, I think that's really more targeted for traditional digital signage applications at this point. Uh, but again, my point is uh, using smaller micro LEDs um, and glass backplane um, lowers cost and uh, for the micro LED uh, part, uh, but also gives you more um, uh, image quality capabilities with uh, active matrix uh, backplane as opposed to um, passive matrix driving. Uh, the Korean Institute of Machinery and Materials showed several stretchable and transparent demos uh, with a roll transfer process. So roll to roll is kind of an interesting uh, development area as well. So obviously this institute is working on, on that. Uh, LG Display showed their stretchable micro LED display up to 20%. That was uh, pretty important to uh, uh, demonstration. They got a lot of uh, uh, press on that. And then TCL CSOT showed an 18.8 inch micro LED with six modules. So they used 20 by 20 micron emitters and they've gone with IGZO on glass, not LTPS on glass, uh, which is again an interesting choice 
uh, for them. So I will pause there if there are any questions on the direct view stuff. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Uh, there's a few things I want to highlight in materials and manufacturing as well. So at Ventama, um, they're developing perovskite uh, quantum dot solutions, and they are demonstrating three ways that you could actually deposit this. Um, one, and that's kind of summarized here in the matrix down below, uh, standard inkjet printing. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, so you can get, um, and they've got some of the, the, the color tech, uh, the details here, four micron, thick, four micron thickness, 2.6 optical density, uh, and then 50% uh, EQE, blah, blah, blah. They also showed it with uh, photolithography. Uh, and then uh, here's this inkjet uh, electrohydrodynamic printing technology here. Uh, and they showed this, uh, this down to 12.5 by 12.5 microns. Um, they showed the photolithography down to about 45 by 45 microns and the standard inkjet at 200 by 200. So you can see there's three different technologies here depending on what size pixels you need to make. And, and depending on your application, you know, you choose the one that, that makes the most sense here. Uh, Kubos Semiconductor is another new um, uh, company. Uh, so I mentioned before that, um, that this, there's a development going on with gallium nitride on gallium nitride uh, bulk. So Kubos Semiconductor basically says, um, well, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can still use gallium nitride on, on sapphire, but you want to use a different um, crystal orientation. Instead of using um, um, the cubic one, they want to use hexagonal. Um, so why people chose cubic, I have no idea. Um, and why they didn't choose hexagonal, I have no idea. <laughs> But cubic, uh, uh, apparently, according to Kubos, cubic offers uh, improved uh, uh, IQE, EQE, and maybe up to three times better improvement for the red uh, gallium nitride. Uh, so ob obtaining red and gallium nitride has always been a problem. Very low uh, EQEs, IQEs. Uh, you can do it, um, but it's been very difficult to do it. Porotech is pioneered, I think, probably perhaps probably the highest uh, IQEs uh, in red on gallium nitride, um, um, but clearly being able to have all three colors in the gallium nitride material system makes a lot of sense. Uh, so you don't, you're not mixing material systems and mixing driver requirements and, make, and uh, um, uh, maintenance requirements for the devices. Uh, so they showed their first demo of a green uh, hexagonal GAN device uh, at Display Week, and they're hopefully going to have this uh, a red demo uh, this fall. Uh, Mick Levy um, is a, um, a, a, I guess they're a process development company, uh, and their their problem, what their the problem that they're trying to solve is this um, is going to uh, enable this silicon processing. Um, and if you want to move to 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter silicon processing for gallium nitride, um, you're going to, you're going, again, in my opinion, you're going to need to move to that direction to get the economies to scale and to get the cost down, uh, especially for these smaller devices. The problem with doing that is, um, one, this is a new material you're introducing into a semiconductor fab, and you know semiconductor fab folks do not like new materials messing up their their foundry. Um, so what what this uh, the, this institute did is they looked at um, how CMOS imagers, the backside illuminated CMOS imager workflow, um, is is created, and basically it's a wafer bonding workflow. Uh, in a semiconductor fab. Um, so they said, well, if they can do it, well, they have a good idea. And what we're going to do is 
is not use um, the the way with the the gallium nitride epi wafers on silicon that have been developed now because even with those interface layers you still get too much bowing and it's a, a material system that's that, that they're concerned about so the bowing problem is basically the problem that you're trying to solve so the way they do that is they take known good dye that have been fabricated uh, in traditional um, uh, ways um, uh, as, um, as, as independent standard wafers. They, they dice the wafers, they test the wafers, they have a bin of known good dye of red, green, and blue wafers, okay? They take from those dyes, and instead of putting it on an intermediate carrier for, let's say, to, to put it on a, a, a display substrate, they put it on a bulk silicon wafer. <laughs> and they're very careful to try and keep the height of those epi layers all the same. And so they have a flat bulk semiconductor wafer. They basically put these chiplets on top of it uh, to create a, a flat planar uh, device that can now go into the semiconductor fab uh, where they can uh, uh, be mated to, to the silicon uh, backplane as, as required. So that, and they've, they've developed that process now, and they've got some tools for doing that, so they're working to try and commercialize that with, with some customers. And uh, Allos Semiconductor is another company that's kind of working on a, a similar approach, I think. So Saflux is an interesting company as well. Uh, so I talked about this, uh, this red conversion problem. Um, so what they do is they um, take this uh, a nanoporous layer that they put on top of the blue LED, uh, and then they infuse um, red quantum dots or green quantum dots, depending on what color you want to color convert to. Uh, and this porous layer, nanoporous layer, um, is supposed to create very high efficiency, 45%, uh, um, compared to the, uh, the uh, Allen gap red, which is probably single digit efficiency. So by having all these material systems in gallium nitride, you simplify the driving, uh, and they've shown that they can get monolithic red and green micro LEDs down as small uh, as five microns. Um, so that can be obviously very suitable for lots of applications, not just uh, AR and VR. Uh, but to get there, um, they're going to start by commercializing uh, a little bit larger devices. These are really mini LED devices at, at 100 by 150 for video wall applications. And they've done a very smart thing, I think. They've taken these kind of mini LED devices um, and they put them in standard uh, LED packages, these 04, 06, or 04, 08 uh, packages. Um, that allows them to be put into standard um, display module production lines for digital signage. Um, so they were showing uh, a, a fairly large demo of this uh, at Display Week. Um, so I think it's a smart strategy. They, you know, this is a, a market that's needed right now. They get some revenue from this and they can fund development to go smaller and smaller. So that's uh, pretty much my micro LED stuff. So any questions before I move on? Last few slides here. Uh, don't see any new ones, Chris. Okay. Uh, I, this is Larry Iboshi. I have, I have one question um, with these micro, uh, for, for glasses or head-mounted displays, what do you think uh, is uh, the killer app? Or is that too broad a question? <laughs> uh, I think everyone wants to know what the killer app is, don't they? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, in a lot of ways, um, these are uh, technologies searching for a solution. I mean, Apple's demonstration of their their VR headset certainly had some of the the fanboys loving it, but there there's a lot of um, a lot of head shaking about some of the applications they were talking about as, as well. Um, I don't know if I know there is a killer application out there yet. Uh, it's going to take, 
you know, that iPhone moment, I think, for someone to put together the technology and the applications that we haven't really thought about yet, maybe. Maybe it's it's the obvious stuff that we've, we've been talking about, but maybe not. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, Chris. Um, yeah. Do you see micro LEDs as being limited to AR, VR uh, uh, headsets and not TVs because of the problems and um, putting laying down the dots and the, and the and of, of for large size TVs? So it's you think it's going to be a limited, limited because of its size to small devices like watches, uh, phones, and AR, VR headsets? No, no. Um, certainly, Samsung and a lot of the display makers see the TV market as as potentially very viable. Uh, I mean, Samsung has products out there. They're super expensive, um, but you know their strategy has always been to introduce the latest technology at very high prices and to bring it down through buying production. Um, we've got a ways to go, as the market forecasters have shown, and we've got a lot of problems to solve, um, as I've you know, talked about many of those problems. But uh, 10 years from now, um, that's going to be a whole different ballgame, <laughs> I think. Uh, but who knows? To be clear, to, to be clear OLED and, and LCD are not going away anytime soon. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Maybe I can some... unmute everybody. Should, well, you, you're gonna. I'll unmute everybody at the end of the session, and they can ask questions at the end of the session. If they don't. Uh, Chris. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. All right, I got a couple of a uh, couple more slides to go through, and then we can open it up. Um, so in, in the 3D space, uh, Real Fiction uh, showed a kind of interesting display here. Um, so this is based on a very a newly developed and very fast mode ferroelectric modulator. Uh, ferroelectric LCD um, has been known to be is very fast. It's bistable, um, uh, which means it it, it it will stay in either an on or an off state without voltage applied. Uh, but it's also historically been um, kind of mechanically unstable. <laughs> um, so working with the um, uh, Professor Kwok in, in Hong Kong, uh, they developed some new materials, uh, and Real Fiction has been working with them to create this 3D display. Uh, and the way this thing works is uh, it uses the micro LED uh, as the image generator. So there's a small um, uh, micro LED panel in the back of the thing, and then in, I guess it's in well in part of the optical path. I haven't seen the optical path, but um, there's probably some kind of a cube combiner here for the uh, um, or a, a cube prism for the LCOS modulator. Um, that basically is used to uh, to steer the light. So this becomes a light steering device, uh, and they chose. Uh, the micro LED because obviously LEDs can be updated very quickly and now with this very fast modulator they have a 5,000 hertz field rate. Um, so you can kind of think of this thing as a sophisticated or a dynamic parallax barrier um, and so the frame rate comes to about 100 hertz uh, so you as you move around this display you, you'll see uh, different images. So um, as they develop this technology, this could turn into kind of a super multi-view uh, auto stereoscopic display, if you will. Um, it's still obviously very early days for this technology, uh, but it's a new architecture and something that you know people who are interested in this uh, should be aware of. Uh, C-Real is a company I like very much. Uh, they're developing a light field display technology uh, for AR applications. Uh, and the, prob the problem that they're solving here for AR is the ability to interact with objects that are basically within your arm's length of you. Uh, almost all AR displays um, start at about arm's length and push the image uh, beyond that. So you really can't have that, that, uh, that interaction with the device very well um, because you, as you get closer, you have problems 
uh, with the Stereopsis one uh, and just the display technology to be able to do that. So going to a light field display uh, really solves that problem. Uh, so it has a, holograph a holographic optical combiner uh, that's laminated to uh, this little, uh, basically, uh, uh, eyeglass optic. Uh, and then they have a light field uh, engine, uh, which uses RGB lasers uh, and a, a, a another ferroelectric LCOS modulator, amplitude modulator, to create these 24 uh, to 32 views, and then algorithms to generate a diffraction patter pattern, not pattern, <laughs> for each view. Uh, and then, um, it, I'm not sure it's obvious in the images here, um, but if, um, if they, you could look through an optic and in their demo here, and at, they're showing this at three meters, you see this globe in focus in the background, and the hummingbird is out of focus. Uh, and then if you refocus at 0.2 meters, the hummingbird is in focus, and now the background, the globe is all out of focus. And this is to show this is a real, um, a real light field display here that's got to, uh, uh, this is not stereopsis that you're looking at, not a, not a stereoscopic display. So that was pretty cool. Uh, some other cool stuff I saw, uh, BOA had this 110-inch 16K display. Uh, it was, I think it's just a, a display that they did because we can, <laughs> uh, just for bragging rights. Uh, the performance is not particularly impressive on this. It's 60 hertz, 400 nits, 1200 to 1. Uh, it's really, I think, more for, for bragging rights, but it, it just shows that, you know, you can do this uh, if you want to do it. Uh, it's not clear that you need 16K and 110 inch, but okay. Uh, question, uh, okay. question, Chris? Yeah. Okay, uh, Scott Daly just asked a question. For the surreal light field display, will objects be limited to translucent slash transparent? as is typical? That's a good question. Um, I, it's probably going to depend on the architecture that you put uh, in it. You're going to have to do something if you want to occlude the, the, um, the object to make it more, to make it non-transparent. Um, I don't think they're trying to do that with, at C-Real, but that's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to it for, for, the, for them. Well, thanks, Scott. Okay, that's all we have right now. Okay. Uh, and then this was definitely a, a cool demo host, demo, uh, uh, TCL CSOT, and this folding inkjet OLED TV. Uh, and uh, it, on the videos, you, on my YouTube channel, you can see this thing going through it. Um, so 65 inch 8K resolution printed in development uh, with J OLED. Um, but J OLED, um, has financial difficulties. They've been trying to license their uh, inkjet printing technology, and they have licensed it to um, CSOT. Uh, and you know, in talking with CSOT's um, uh, uh, CEO, uh, he said basically their their development is done. They have the commercial licenses in place. It's really going to be more a market decision at this point um, if there's a market to justify the considerable investment to. Uh, to develop a fab and, and commercialize this technology. And then this was also kind of a, a cool thing that, that I saw as well. Um, Vitria Lab uh, is uh, out of uh, Austria, as I recall. Um, and they developed basically a, a, a backlight, a laser sourced backlight for AR and VR displays that works with uh, DLP or LCOS micro displays. So um, you know, there's lots of ways to create a backlight for a micro display, um, but what they're doing is they have these red, green, and blue single mode laser sources uh, that they put into this uh, specially designed waveguide, which they call a quantum light chip, uh, which basically fans out the RGB across the whole, this whole surface area uniformly. Uh, and then they have a nanostructure, kind of a reflector on the backside to extract it vertically. Um, so this is, is designed to create a very uniform um, backlight with very directional light. So that can go right, right to the LCOS or the DLP microdisplay with a very high eight-ton dew. 
to create very high efficiency. Um, uh, so they had their VR demo said they could reach 10,000 nits and with four dimming zones. So that's kind of interesting as well. Uh, think about that. If they can increase the number of dimming zones, you've got a, a nice HDR VR display here, which is, um, well, that's where people want to go, right? <laughs> Uh, so I, I like what these guys are doing, and they also showed it on AR device uh, with this as well. And that is it. So thank you. And if you want to open up for any further questions, uh, please do so. Okay, we have everybody. Anybody can unmute themselves right now if they want to ask a question. I think Chris, I'm trying to unmute everybody, but I can't. But okay. you're right, everybody can unmute, unmute themselves. Chris, I think you have to unmute everybody. Do no, I, I think I can do it here, but uh, they have to unmute themselves also. Let's see. This, uh, this is Larry Iboshi. I, I see uh, Seth Sullivan here and Bob Schmal and, and Dave Eccles. So just, it's just a shout out to say hi to these guys. I think I've, I thought I unmuted everyone. Uh, let me try that again. Unmute all participants, it says. Seth. Uh, you can unmute yourselves now, it says. Yeah. Hey, guys. Yeah, no, that works now. <laughs> okay, any questions okay. for Chris? Uh, no, no, but I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Chris. I have one qu uh, one question. Vit Vitria Lab seems pretty interesting. What is you don't I don't think you have the resolution there. What is the resolution, or is it uh, scalable? Um, Scal yeah, it's scalable. Whatever they they chose for the LCOS chip, I don't recall. It was probably full HD, but I don't really don't remember. Well, that sounds pretty. Uh, that seems like the chip uh, they need for AR VR, because that would yeah. be extremely bright oh yeah yeah and very efficient yep hey uh chris this is dave eccles I have a kind of a question yep. there was a, a lot of talk in ar vr uh like products devices the of achieving uh what's kind of called eye limiting resolution one arc minute or 60 pixels per degree and right. if that's like 180 degrees that becomes like 10,000 pixels across or if it's 100 degrees, that's 6,000 pixels. Uh, and then there's a certain class of uh, AR devices that are like a high focus or high resolution in the center, field of view, like 20 or 30 degrees. And personally, I think that's going to be the solution because these, if you ever get over 100 degrees, uh, no matter how high resolution your micro device is, it's going to be poor compared to a normal display for the eye. So do you have any take or any uh, particular opinion on, on that, those kind of things? Yeah, yeah, well, obviously the fovea is a is very small part of your vision. That's the only part that really matters because everything else is just low resolution, right? right. Um, so if, I think it makes a lot of sense to um, either, well, eye tracking, if you do eye tracking, you kind of need to have a full resolution display over that whole, that whole area. Um, so if you just keep the center part, it's kind of a compromise, I guess, uh, to have that, that center phobia. So if you're looking in the, in the, the side part of the image, if you will, um, it does become lower resolution and you are putting your phobia up there, but that's, I mean, most people want to want to bring the, the object of interest into the center of the screen anyway. So you would most likely rotate your head to look at that object if it was in the periphery anyway. So I think it makes sense to have either two displays that have a high resolution center and a lower resolution background, or you could think about a display that just varies that resolution from uh, a single display. It varies it from uh, high to low density. No one, I don't think anyone's actually shown that in the single display, but it makes, I think it makes sense personally. Chris, can you bring up your uh, screen? 
uh, uh, first uh, page uh, so everybody can see where your uh, YouTube site is and they can get a screen, capture a screenshot. Oh, what did I do? Hold on. The, every, you can uh, get a screenshot of the, uh, of the uh, IP address. There we go. All right. Uh, I, I, if there are are no more questions, I'd like to thank the speak. Uh, I'll go one more time. Are there one, are there any more questions? Going once. Going twice. Going three times. I'd like to thank the speak. Thank you, Chris, for taking the time to speak uh, at this uh, uh, at the LA chapter SID meeting. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks all. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Round of applause.